Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you very much for your friendship, for your really committed leadership of this committee, and to your really fair treatment of, of everybody on the committee. I'd like to thank the uh, sub, uh, committee staff for their really hard work and professionalism and all the work that's taken place behind the scenes to get this mark done. As I said, during our oversight hearings, there is no doubt that this budget and the decisions that come along with it will fundamentally change the United States Air Force and Army. During our full committee and subcommittee hearings, a consistent theme has carried through, and I want to echo it here today. I feel that there has been an absence of thoughtful debate, discussion, and analysis due to the lack of information from the Department to support this budget request. I see two problems. First, the budget should not drive the strategy. The strategy should be set, then the funding requirements are laid out in the budget that follows. It appears to me that in many cases, funding limitations in the FY 2010 budget top line were the sole driver in major policy decisions. The second problem I see is that instead of openly engaging the legislative branch on policy matters, proposed force structure changes and the shifting of requirements for major weapons platforms, the executive branch has chosen to lock us out of those debates and tie our hands by unveiling sweeping policy changes buried under the guise of budget requests. A case in point is the joint cargo aircraft. I have asked witnesses from the Army, the Air Force, and OSD, what has changed? Why is the mission being moved out of the Army and solely over to the Air Force when not four months ago we received the Quadrennial Roles and Missions Review Report that stated, and I quote, the option that provided most value to the Joint Force was to assign the C-27J to the Air Force and Army. None of them have been able to answer the question, but all of them stated that there was no new study or analysis conducted that countered the existing plan or reduced the JROC approved requirement for 78 joint cargo aircraft, that was Army only, that did not include the aircraft that the uh, Air Force needed. What has happened as a result of all this is that the Congress is now left to debate the puts and takes in the budget when there has been no vetting of the underlying threat assumptions, policy, or strategy. This body, not the executive branch, is charged with a constitutional mandate to raise and support armies and navies. I'm extremely troubled that these decisions have been made in a vacuum and appear, at least on the surface, to be informed by nothing other than top-line budget pressures. Mr. Chairman, I want to be very clear that my frustration is with the Department, not this mark. In fact, given the little information we have received, I believe you, our members on both sides of the aisle, and our staff have done an amazing job. As I have said on many occasions, this subcommittee has a long tradition of focusing on those issues that most impact and help our brave men and women in uniform. And I know the chairman is extremely committed to make, taking care of our military, and he takes it very seriously. Just a few examples include your continued support of increasing the National Guard equipment account and the service's unfunded priority list, and the changes the chairman's mark makes in regards to body armor is long overdue and will no doubt help our war fighters tremendously for years to come. Finally, I would like to briefly comment on the Army's future combat systems. As we all know, the Secretary of Defense announced the decision to restructure the program and terminate the manned ground vehicles. As the Chairman knows, this subcommittee has been asking the hard questions in regard to future combat systems since 2004. We have consistently had concerns in regard to the survivability of the manned ground vehicle, uh, but we have never questioned the validity of the need uh, for the Army to modernize and replace a combat vehicle fleet that is in excess of 30 years old. The problem I have is that there is still much information we need from the Office of the Secretary of Defense so that we can make informed decisions. Yet here we are today, two months after the Secretary's announcement, and we still do not have a signed acquisition decision memorandum, which spells out the top-level plan for the restructured program. As a result, we are forced to make some very difficult decisions that I would prefer we not have to make. I recall in 2006 when this subcommittee introduced a congressionally mandated go-no-go no go review of the FS, uh, C, FCS program, which is supposed to take place this summer. As I recall, part of the rationale for that provision was to give OSD another opportunity to provide adult supervision of the program. It appears that OSD 
is now very involved with the program. Mr. Chairman, my point is that it is not the Army's fault that we don't have all the information we need to make a fully informed decision. My hope is that when we are making up this bill next year that we will be complimenting the Army and OSD for putting together a robust program with supporting rationale so that we can say we support the program and will fully fund it per the President's budget request. But in order to do that, we will need a lot more information and will need to not only hold the Army accountable, but it must uh, also hold OSD accountable. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to moving ahead on these issues with you and the members of this subcommittee. We have our work cut out for us, and we all understand the responsibility we have to ensure the men and women of our armed forces are prepared with the very best in equipment, resources, and authorities. This mark takes important steps towards that goal, and I ask all members for their support of the language before them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.